Danica. All righty, give me one second. I was pulling it back up, uh, so I'm going to work out there. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. It is October 7th, and welcome to the Social Equity um, Subcommittee meeting. We just hit our first milestone on October 1st, where a uh, report was turned in for the plan for reducing or eliminating fees for social equity applicants. We have additional deadlines coming up, so this is a good critical meeting, and we're happy everyone could make the time today. I'd like to go to the agenda. I'm going to officially call the meeting to order now. Um, and also, I'm going to ask if we have a motion to approve the minutes from 10-4. Motion. Do I have a second? Thank you so much. All right, great. Let the record reflect that the minutes for 10-4 have been approved. There are no public comments this week. Uh, so, Julie, I would ask, do we have any members of the public in the room with us today? We do. We have two members of the public. Welcome. Fantastic. At 10 till the hour, we will open up the floor to public comments for those who are in the room. But as a reminder to anyone watching the video, if you would like to submit public comments, you may do so at ccb.vermont.gov. There's a public input form, but you can fill everything out, and you can also attach files and provide any additional resources. So I'm going to flip back, and this is today's agenda. We'll be going through exclusive licensing for social equity applicants, delivery, a co-op, cannabis business development fund, and then, of course, ending, as I just noted, with public comments. So with that being said, Gina, I am going to turn this over to you and I will be updating and writing in real time with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Before we begin, I just want to take attendance for everybody. I'm so sorry. I forgot Ashley. that. Present. Nader. Present. Julie from the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Yep. Here. From NACD, we have Danica. Here. We have John taking notes. Present. Present. We have Susanna from Vermont government. Present. Great. Um, who is absent right now is Julio and uh, Jeffrey. Uh, he is out sick from NACB. Uh, we will make sure after this meeting to send them the minutes and our presentation as well. Thank you. So exciting times, everyone. We are on exclusive licenses. So we're going to consider um, if there should be any exclusive licenses for social equity candidates. Please note, none of these licenses are in any of the cannabis regulations. So we will be making recommendations for them to be added. So. Do not despair. I think recommendations go a really long way. Um, and I think, you know, Vermont is open to seeing these um, licenses. So as we spoke about last week, about delivery licenses and cooperative licenses, one of the things that we also have to establish, if we're saying that these will be exclusive to social equity candidates, um, will there be a time limit of exclusivity? We, we have discussed that in other states. They often do make a time period where these licenses are introduced um, and then social equity. So for delivery, there was uh, three years or four years on um, term periods and then they will re look at it again and see if they want to open it to everyone or just keep it as a social equity. So we should also consider that when we are discussing these licenses. So I'm going to go into our first one with delivery. I know people wanted to speak about different models that there are in the industry. We will discuss that, but one of the things that I want us to focus on is not to try to limit what Vermont chooses to do for um, licensing. So if we can kind of be a little bit more open-ended and really defined um, on it, but I'll give you some of the choices that Vermont may choose. So Massachusetts does uh, marijuana courier. It was previously called our deliver delivery only license. The next few licenses um, slides that I'm going to show you about delivery was created by Jeffrey um, Gallego. And unfortunately, he couldn't be with us because he was going to present them. So um, just please note that for the record, he's done a really great job on giving us all of these slides and explaining what models are out there. 
And so this is what we were discussing sort of last week, you know, acting as a marijuana courier, you know, picking up marijuana from a retail shop and bringing it to the consumer or the patient if it is a medicinal uh, patient. Right now, currently, this model is allowed for the medicinal cannabis industry in Vermont. And just to know on this model, marijuana cannot be stored um, overnight. So if you have a delivery and the person doesn't answer it, it needs, definitely needs to be returned to the retail store, AKA the dispensary. Now there's another model here. It's a marijuana delivery operator. And so this would allow um, a person to be able to store marijuana. So we like to compare that to um, the ice cream truck store. Um, you are able to get products from the cultivator and the manufacturer. I'm sorry, I'm seeing some notes. Can you not see the slide? I, I can now. I just had to bump out of the meeting and went back in. So now I'm, now I'm with you. Sorry about that, Gina. Oh, no worries. Okay. Next time, kind of just jump in there and just say, gee, wait, wait a minute. Um, Rana, can you see the slides? Are you able to see them now? Yeah, sorry. Same deal with me. I left and came back and it okay. worked. All right, fantastic. Thank you. Did everybody on the call right now hear about the, a marijuana carrier license? Yeah. Can you do one more time? Yep. We'll go back to the beginning. So one of the delivery license types that are out there is a marijuana courier license. You currently sort of have this license type without calling it a license type that in the medicinal cannabis dispensary, they are able to courier a product to a patient. So basically with this one, you have a retail dispensary. They have a customer who needs delivery to them. The courier service picks up the product that is locked in a sealed container from the dispensary and then brings it over to the patient. Um, we, of course, we're not going to create any legislation around this, but you know, they would need to confirm it's the person, the age, and also the responsibility is also with the retail to do the same thing. Um, with this license, you cannot, um, the courier person cannot store marijuana overnight. The second is a marijuana delivery operator, and this per person would be able to purchase marijuana and any of their products from a cultivator or a product manufacturer, and they can sell and deliver to customers directly. So what we like to compare this to is an ice cream truck. And in some states, it's a natural truck. Um, they get in orders and they say, you know, do I have the product with me? Do I, I, do I have this in my inventory and can deliver it to them? Or they can pick up more from a retail store or manufacturer and deliver to them. So it's like a third party. All right, I'm gonna sell you products and then you sell those products. Um, we see this often with some um, online retail. Um, and then that is also similar to the wholesale delivery license. It's the same thing. Um, you're able to pick up and, and sell and, and hold on to products overnight and that's sort of your inventory base. So you're sort of acting like your own dispensary in store. And then we have, I know someone made mention of the Ease model, um, which is in a couple of different states, which is an online platform. So they act as like a DoorDash or like Uber Eats, for example. You go online, you research, you put in your zip code, you research what dispensaries are around, you click on the dispensary, they have an inventory list, you click what you want, you check out with that dispensary retailer, and then the courier then says, you need to pick up this client's product and then they go to the dispensary, they pick it up, they deliver it to somebody's door. 
One of the ways that we are thinking about with the Vermont retail delivery is that what might be the easiest way to get in um, to start off delivery in Vermont is to have a delivery courier system. Uh, but that courier system is related to the retail. So they have that as a delivery add-on if they want to hire a delivery licensee where the retail employs the driver, they employ the vehicle, and they are taking, uh, they have to provide insurance coverage for the driver. Um, they are giving authority to the customer to be able to call in or shop online from the realtor and then the delivery courier then brings the product to the customer. We like to call this the pizza delivery. I make a pizza delivery, call in my order, they, they send someone out to send me my product. Um, and this is also really the least expensive way for a social equity licensee to get into the business. It is also a good way of keeping security on the item and also making sure um, that the illness falls on the retailer, the dispensary itself, to really choose who they would like and also ensuring you know 21 ages, the payment processing system, etc. Because with some of these models, for example, Ease or a wholesaler slash delivery operator, there would be a lot more issues. A social equity licensee would need certain trusts, certain regular um, cars, storage ability, insurance. Um, they take more liability of who they're selling the product to. Uh, it's just a lot more that is really involved with those larger sort of delivery models. I'm not saying that Vermont should not adopt any of them, but this would be a really first easy step to create. Uh, I just would like sort of everybody's opinion about delivery or maybe we just keep this open-ended that we're happy to see any of these models be implemented um, in Vermont. Nader, how do you feel about this? So, you know, with, with, with the first license that we're talking about, um, where the delivery driver is a part of the retail business, uh, I, I think that's a good idea. Uh, I think that they're, you know, my, my mind goes to legislators who are going to oppose this, and you know, my first thought is that a lot of concern is given to highway safety and just road safety in general. And you know, there will be this concern that people are going to drive themselves to retail shops, buy their cannabis, and then smoke in that area and then drive around. Whereas you know, having it delivered to their house or rental or apartment. Um, that could relieve that fear, I think. Uh, the ice cream truck model, I think that's, I don't think it's a terrible idea. I think there's pros and cons. Um, you know, I think about how rural Vermont is and how, you know, some folks may not have transportation to go to and from retail locations. Um, but I also think that it's kind of, it, it, it's a lot of steps forward all at once when it comes to trying to follow this ice cream truck idea. So those are my initial thoughts. Thank you. Ashley? Uh, I just want to piggyback on the ice cream truck model. You know, I've, I've seen a little bit of that in New York City, and I think it's I think it's much. Uh, I do think that delivery is going to be essential in Vermont because of how rural we are. Um, I like the idea of the retailer license having it as an add-on because that will definitely be important for retailers. I don't know that they should have the add-on for a year that they open their retail facility. So that could provide a little bit of a gateway if we did want to do an exclusivity 
for or an exclusive for those licenses for social ex, um, for SD licensee holders. Like I think there could be uh, some compromise in there to help encourage those folks to get into that sector. I think that's also a really nice gateway to like understanding what it's like to kind of sub to these retailers or sub to these wholesalers and really get to know all the players that are going to be in the market. So I like the community development involvement in that. Um, let's see, what else? The calling and getting your weed, I mean like that is I think anybody who's a tourist is going to expect that. The Airbnb rate around here is incredibly high. I think, you know, I think that's going to be really, really important to have. Um, what I do want to avoid, though, is like folks coming up like to resort and doing like the ice cream truck round, like just like parking in, you know, valet and like people just come like that's going to prevent all of those people from coming to, out of their hotels and going either to a farm or going to a dispensary and kind of getting outside of that resort field. So, um, so I'm with Nader on that front. I do like the idea, though, of what Massachusetts did of offering it um, for the first couple of years. So that, that's an interesting point that I'd be willing to keep exploring. How many years would you be interested in giving exclusivity to social equity candidates? Like around three or four years? Um, what are your thoughts, more or less? Well, that being a hypothetical, then would retailers who want to have a delivery service be required to have social equity applicants as their, you know, as their delivery service? Because that could be cool too. Is it like really? Yeah. Interesting? I need, yeah. Exactly. Um, the way that we can ensure that, you know, we are getting also social equity candidates in, into the industry and be take part in it. Um, I don't know about the amount of years. I wanna look I wanna ask Jennifer um, like when they started their match program to like how effective, like how many people are utilizing that type of a of a license. Because uh, if it's a ton, then it means the program works. If it's the same amount as anybody, you know, in a state that doesn't have it as an exclusivity, I, I just kind of want to look and see if we can ask Jennifer that. So they do more of a, a bigger business uh, model than what we're suggesting here. Um, and it, it did start earlier this year and go to 2024 when they re revisit um, if this will just remain exclusive for social equity. And I think there's about four licenses right now um, that they, they have issued for that. And so, you know, this is obviously sort of a, a very different thing. You know, it's just really going to depend on, you know, how many social equity candidates want this in Vermont. Um, I'd like us to, to look at Massachusetts because it's a, it's a very close state that has social equity, but we always have to rem remember just, you know, size elements um, of doing a comparison. I, I think that, you know, when we make this suggestion that we have to say, you know, that the social equity board has to revisit this in maybe six months a year and see if this is working out or not. Because, if, of course, if there's not enough licensees out there who are going to get delivery, we have to allow for retail to be able to look out of um, having someone who has a delivery license. But I think we have heard many uh, public comments already that people are really in support of delivery and really want this. Um, so, you know, I think based on anything, is you know, this is a new program and every single um, legislation that is created around it has to be revisited to ensure um, that it is working properly. Uh, so with that being said, about this time frame, do you, would you like to see it at four years? A lot of often it's about this three to four year um, exclusivity in other states. Would you um, do five years or yeah. more or less? To think about the actual the actual timing of it because if you think about this like in, in intervals of like what the first year looks like and what the needs are versus the second year and what the needs are there's going to be a lot more need in that second third fourth year 
um, because there's going to be more of us that need the service for delivery. Um, so I, I let me take a little bit more on that. Yes, Anna, how do you feel about the delivery license? I think that um, I like it as proposed. And I just am still really thinking a lot about the, um, the intertwining with other systems like the justice system and et cetera. I don't have fully formed thoughts, but that's where I am right now. Thank you, Susanna. Do you like the Vermont retail delivery license idea? I'm just confirming which um, slide you're referring to. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, I, I like this proposal particularly because it, it helps to place the onus on the more powerful party. Um, you know, when I was, when I was in New York, there was, um, Suddenly, overnight, the NYPD wanted to start enforcing all of the electric bicycle um, laws because you're not supposed to have them, but all the delivery drivers did. And it was like the drivers, because were the ones getting fined. These have to find, but really, you know, it was the employers who kind of wanted them to use the new machines. And so, anyway, that's a tangent. But um, I just, I think that it's really important that we put the responsibility on the right parties. And I think that this helps to do that. Thank you so much. And Julio, I see that you've joined us. I've been I, here for a while. I just didn't have my camera on. Oh, okay. Um, so with the delivery models, I know you've received the PowerPoint presentation and you might have heard us uh, discuss that. How do you feel about um, this Vermont retail delivery license? And, you know, if, if you don't like this, is, is there another model that, that you might like more? Well, I would say if Vermont is going to do retail delivery, I, I agree with the others who have said that starting with an employee-based and, you know, retailer-based delivery service uh, would probably be the, um, the best way to step forward and then see how deliveries work out. My understanding from Massachusetts, and I'm not the expert, but I've done a little reading in advance of this meaning my understanding is that Massachusetts started retail sales in 2018, but they only started home delivery service this past July. And I know the pandemic may have affected that, but um, it looks like it didn't all launch at the same time. Um, for, that, for they, were also, they were making a more, um, they originally were gonna go with a courier service, Right. Um, and then some of their social equity um, candidates really wanted it to be more of a business model. Um, so that was one part of the delay of it. Um, but I believe they had a uh, courier service for their medicinal cannabis, which is the same that Vermont has right now. And those are state employees that do that for Vermont doesn't, or does Vermont contract with a delivery service for medical? Um, I'm not sure. I, I believe it's an internal. I think so. that's, that's I'm what I'm not sure. Julie, do you have the answer to that? Yes. Yeah, so I believe that they're employees of the dispensary. I don't think that they're for the medical program. I don't think that they're connected to the state of Vermont at all. Right, but they're. But they're I'm sorry, I made a mistake in speaking there. That they, yeah, they're dispensary employees. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I. I think because I think there's another other committees that are going to provide advice and guidance on how delivery would work things like security verification and so forth so i'm not so i'm assuming if they are able to work that out uh, i'm comfortable with what you have on the screen which is the retailer based delivery service for me uh, uh one i think at least the little bit of reason i said there are a lot of people who want delivery uh, like there's a market <coughs> for home consumption and there may be a benefit to have people who are going to deliver so at least you don't have to worry or speculate about whether people are using in the car on the way home, uh, which is a, maybe a little assuring. Um, so assuming that those details can work out, the benefits of having the employer-based one is that 
the concern I worry about is that you have you get you can also if you just go straight to like a quote gig economy model there may be a risk of economic exploitation of people who themselves might not have experience in commerce to be to be the best advocates or have the most power for themselves so an employee if they were injured for example during delivery there's an auto accident or something like that you know workers compensation would provide uh, a safety net for that they would be um, you know the, the vehicles would be subject to you know it's the, the, the duty to maintain a, a working vehicle to make sure, especially in Vermont where the climate can be uh, friendly um, a, a, at certain times of the year, that that's a safe vehicle for them and to put the onus on that. So I think Susanna raised those points about about cost shifting. I saw someone raise their hand, so I'm gonna stop. And All right, great point. That was a great point, Julio. Um, Ashley, I see your hand raised. I was curious, like, Thinking about how small businesses work, you you know, you wear all the hats, you do all the things. Are cultivators going to be able to take their plant material and drive it to a dispensary for sale? I guess I'm like I'm missing a step. Or is this delivery service going to be implemented so that you have to use a carrier service? Because I see that in, in some ways of being kind of, yes, a little bit more expensive for the cultivator, but a lot more security knowing that this person is licensed. They went through the whole process of getting the, you know, whatever type of vehicle they have or insurance they have. They know the protocol. Perhaps there's going to be, you know, some bud tending certification so that they know how to properly c carry one to place to the other and how to, you know, to do that. Um, so just, if you can speak to that, I'm just, because I'm not I, I don't I actually I think that that is a really great point and I would love to sort of say that it's called you know we can add cultivation here but I think that's really a compliance and enforcement um, uh, subcommittee uh, distinction there and uh, I'm just gonna take a call um, then you guys see your hand raised and then I would love to vote on this because we have some other licenses to look at as well Danica Julie, um, I believe that Bryn shared with us um, what the retailer license can do. Um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, transport, possess, and sell. Does that sound right? Yes. And that may answer I your think question. What this is, what's different here is that this is delivery not from one business to another, but from a business to a home. Got it. So, that's what, so that was my question, is, is it clear in the, in the license type too? Yes, it's clear in the license type what the retailers can do. Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. So I would like us to vote on that. Yes, we would like to have a delivery license recommendation that this be added to current licenses that will be exclusive for social equity candidates. Um, timing of that to be determined by the Vermont Cannabis Control Board and that we are recommending the retail delivery um, with the details that are on slide 13 of this presentation, which is the retail license with delivery add-on, the retailer employs the driver, the vehicle and insurance coverage for the driver, um, the social equity licensee, um, is the one who delivers the product to the customer um, and they are given this authorization from the dispensary please send this out and it's um sort of comparison to a pizza delivery um service and that they are employees of that dispensary nader how do you vote on this uh before i vote i just hoping for some further clarity. Are we voting on how many years this license will be exclusive, or is that no. for a further discussion or another discussion? Uh, I think maybe we just leave that in the hands of yeah. the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Okay. Just check. Uh, so uh, my vote is yes. I I support the uh, license scheme that we've discussed. Thank you, Ashley. 
Um, I'm still a little on the fence. So I, I, just my questions are the, you said that the exclusivity aspect, that's later. That's not a part of this. But just- No, I'm referring to Wild Vermont Cannabis Control Board to, to deal with the time periods and what they think is appropriate based on all the other different licensing schemes, et cetera. So I'm voting on if the a delivery license should even be added to the licensees or licenses that are being offered to social equity applicants. <laughs> yeah, so we are voting on adding a delivery license to the current licenses available, yeah. allowing that for exclusivity to social equity mm -hmm. for whatever time period the Vermont Cannabis Control Board deems appropriate. Um, and suggesting the retail delivery model to the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. Okay, so so yes to everything but exclusivity um, for social equity applicants for that particular. I, so you so, do not want that only social equity licensees can get this license. Yeah. Okay, because this, when we're talking about this license, it's only for social equity candidates. Forever and always? Yeah, not forever, for a time period determined by the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. And we can make a recommendation. Um, because we were all sort of unclear of what that time period should be, um, I was gonna let that to be the Vermont Cannabis Control Board, but we can talk after this, this vote about how many years we think let, let's hold the vote and let's discuss if you want to make a recommendation of how many years. I mean, how many more years do you think this should be exclusive to, to um, social licensing? I don't know that I can vote yet, Gina. I think I, I really need to think about this because um, that's going to be a really important license to hold just based off of our state. Like, we, we will need this indefinitely. And so I, ju I don't know that I'm ready to vote. And so what I'm, I will say to you that all of the licenses that we are talking about are going to be exclusive for social equity licenses. And right now there is no delivery license that is being offered for the uh, recreational use market. So adult use does not have delivery as a licensee at all. Um, can you just, can you pass on me? Can I get just a yes, little bit? Yes, great. Um, Julio, would you like to um, discuss a a time period before before your vote on Vermont re retail delivery? Uh, before I, I can make a judgment about how long we to vote, I just want to make sure that I understand who holds the license. This is a license that would go to somebody. It, it's like a second license or an amendment to your existing social equity retailer license. So it's held by the retailer, not by the driver? It's held by the driver. Okay. So it would be, a, you would have to apply for a social equity license. Okay, And so. then the retailer who would like to have delivery can hire those people who have a retail delivery license. So the, the kind of the core of drivers for some period of time would be exclusively social equity candidates who then would Correct. be eligible for hire, presumably could be hired by more than one employer. Uh, you could have a joint employer, um, the situation. Um, uh, yeah, so with that understanding, um, I, I like the idea um, that that's on the board. Um, and I don't, I, I'm comfortable with the board setting the level of the period of exclusivity. I think they, they, because they have a better sense as to how many licenses they expect to issue and the number of licenses or the, the fees that would be involved um, and all of that. And I don't have those, those facts. Um, so um, I, I'm, I'm, I think it, it should be exclusive at the beginning because I think one of the, the objectives of the legislation in, in 
is that this, these new markets are as open as possible to people who would face barriers to getting into commerce otherwise. And being a driver is probably like the, the, the easiest on-ramp to enter this economy the, because there's no capital cost. You know, I mean, you have to qualify and be competent, um, a competent employee, but you don't have to, you know, get venture capital or buy buildings and let, rent property and equipment and so forth. Um, so for me to have that market begin to open up to, to this group for a period of time, I think it, it, it's, um, I, I think is really a, a good idea, but I don't have a sense to like what the projections are for what this economy would look like. Um, you know, like, is it, you know, is it blank billion dollars per year? Are people estimating based on some economic projections I haven't seen? I don't know. Okay. But I'm, I'm comfortable letting that kind of, that's more of an economic calculation um, to, to let the board sort that out because I think they have more information than we can. Thank you. I agree with that. And Julio, thank you for bringing that up, which is why I said for the Vermont Cannabis Control Board to determine that um that timing exclusivity part of this because they will know um what they're they would have better predictions of how long this really is feasible for um so are you saying yes to this model with the time period should be determined by the vermont cannabis control board yes thank you ashley uh, thank you for all of that, Julio. Those are awesome questions, um, and I think I'm I'm with that. I can vote yes. Thank you. So, where our recommendation is that delivery licenses are added as an exclusivity for the social equity market, we are also making a recommendation that um, the Vermont Cannabis Control Board makes a recommendation um, to add this as a license type. Um, exclusive time period for them to be determine um, based on the need for Vermont to make this for a social equity exclusive license period. We are also making a recommendation that they follow the retail delivery model. Um, and I just want one more clarification and both if the Cannabis Control Board deems that a another model is better uh, with all of the information that they have that um, that they will be changing the model that we choose. Leo, I guess they always have that right, right? I mean, that's yeah, they always have you, that. I mean, I think if they have another model that they think would deliver better or additional services to particularly the social equity part of that economy. I mean, I would hope they would let us know in case we have public comments or, or other perspectives on that. But uh, I understand that they're free to take or, or, mm -hmm. or modify or decline our recommendations. So, I mean, I think you're just stating what is what, the what, state what of is affairs. Anyway, yeah. So I, like, I, mean, I think yeah, that's the current situation. The, and anything that we come up with the subcommittee is just a recommendation. You know, they will be seeing fit so far. But um, so far, all the recommendations that we made for our first ones have passed. Um, so so we're, I think we're doing a really great job. Before I move on to co-op, I would really like to have public comment period, Julie, if that's okay. I know that's a few minutes early, but just so that we aren't cut in the middle of discussing, discussing co-op and not have enough time? Um, I'm fine with that, Gina. If someone comes in before the end of the meeting, though, we'd, I'd offer them an opportunity to comment as well, like if they were coming just for that. And I'll let you know if that happens. Do you have public comment? Thank you. Shall I rotate? Oh, you can, yeah. Oh, hi, everybody. Uh, ben Mervis, great to see you again. Um, so I, I appreciate this conversation. I appreciate everyone's thoughtfulness and in particular the subcommittee members' hesitance around this in some ways. Um, you know, I, I took a lot of notes and what this comes down to for me and having seen this roll out in other markets, 
ultimately it feels like this is a job that we're approving. It, it feels like we're uh, talking about a license to hold a delivery job. Um, and whatever the time limit may be, um, which just by the way, always recommend that time limits be set from the date that the first license is granted. It's just helpful language for, um, that's something that Massachusetts has run into is the three year time limit was not assigned to when the time, when the clock starts. Um, but it really feels like three years, four years, five years, it's just exclusivity on a job and that job is specifically delivery. Um, I would say when talking about social equity applicants, it's really important to look at their driving experience and how um, a lot of these applicants, if they're coming out of uh, incarceration, they haven't been driving for many years. Um, if they are low socioeconomic, they may not be used to driving around their city, never mind the state. Um, as Julio said, uh, excuse me for using your first names if you don't mind, um, but okay. as you said, Julio, you know this is a gig economy that we're essentially talking about creating. It does really easily lead to economic exploitation. Um, from what we've seen in California, Massachusetts, this is basically a ticking time clock until these folks lose their exclusivity and then the power is fully in the retail license holder to say, you know what, as much as we've enjoyed this exclusivity period, we're going to now bring this in-house, you can apply for this job if you would like, is essentially where this leaves us. So I would just recommend, um, in particular to the CCB, to consider the other models as well. Um, in addition to this, it's great to offer this lowest barrier option, um, but the other models do have more opportunity for proliferation, to grow with the market, um, and to create at least some what more of a, of a profit margin, because this right here is most likely going to be limited to a fee on top of the purchase, and that's what the license holder is going to take home, and that's going to be a minimal profit, um, so it's really limiting the opportunity that's available to the applicant. I also wanted to just add, Ease gets a lot of mention. I worked directly with them in California. Definitely worth looking into their financial disclosures and the fact that in less than six years, they had to raise over $255 million and required bridge loans to continue because they were constantly losing money on these deals because in order to get people to, uh, use delivery as opposed to just going to the store, they had to offer discount codes to make the delivery fee free. Um, and so that meant that the delivery drivers were getting their hourly, but there were, if, if, if a delivery fee was being paid, there was no tip. If the delivery fee was waived, then the drivers were getting minimal tips. Um, I do have a public comment that I wrote because I wanted to include as much information as possible for you all, just building on my last statement about social consumption. So you'll see that next week when it makes its way through the system. Um, but I've taken up enough of your time. Thank you so much. Okay. Other public comment? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We're all set for now, Gina. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Ben. I know men Ben mentioned which we included in here because it's raised a public comment period. Um, as, as we have recommended something where you would be a direct employee um, versus an ease model is because ease is very expensive um, and they also had some issues um, and, you, and you can see with advertising but also um, with payment processing you know it's a, it's a very big issue in this industry um, and at first they didn't get it right and so we are trying to eliminate social equity facing the same, following the same journey path as that, um, as new to the cannabis industry, um, which was that they were using a credit card processor and they weren't able to do that and um, they were fined and some people did wind up in prison for it. Um, so, you know, these are lots of things and why we really want to educate uh, social equity candidates about this industry. It's a very different industry um, than any, any other um, due to the federal restrictions that is placed upon it. So, yes, we do take that into mind and consideration, but did pro uh, provide it as a model 
um, based on recommendations on Monday. So we are ready for co-op licenses. I know we only have about 10 minutes left. Um, so we just kind of start to, to, to discuss this, you know, and first of all, we have a, we're going to say why co-op licenses. You know, we've already talked about this cannabis business development fund, which we'll speak more about next week, about that there is only $500,000 that is allocated. There are a possible funds of $50,000 for integrated licenses, but at this time, we don't know if anyone will sign up for those. Um, and dividing loans or creating or even having grants amongst other people, you know, we're, it might be very, very minimal at best. Um, and then we also have to take into account the administrative aspects of the Cannabis De um, Development Fund. And we have to also take into aspect of how much that education is going to um, cost um, to run. Um, also, Canvas businesses is very expensive. And when we start thinking about what is the most expensive cost of social equity candidates, that is gonna be land and equipment. And land being the really a huge burdensome um, to people, you know, that rent expense all of the time. So, and, and you know, there have been public comments made of like, you know, some social equity candidates may not know anything about cannabis, but really trying to get into um, a new industry. So, you know, working together united is, is really stronger. And so we have considered to have a co-op license and that a different approach to using some of the money that has been allocated for the Cannabis Development Fund is to pull it together and to have land and equipment purchased. We can, once the program starts out, having social equity candidates pay more monthly rent to support the program and that this co-op would include cultivation, processing, um, ability to sell cannabis from the licensed premise. Um, this works really well with a suggested license that they have out there right now, which is the farm to consumer um, license. So I really just kind of want to start discussing um, these aspects. Julio? What are your thoughts about a co-op license? Um, again, subject to the, the co-op experts working out the, the the actual operation in a way that you know doesn't uh, offend the antitrust laws and um, um, you know and, and has a as a mechanism, I think it's um, um, a great opportunity. Um, it, it, to me, it looks like it's another way to lower barriers for um, disadvantaged candidates to enter uh, into the economy, uh, especially given that there, at least right now, there's a relatively, uh, well, I guess it's all a matter of opinion, but to me it seems like a relatively limited um, pool of resources that could be granted to them individually. Um, and although this is not an agricultural industry, um, Vermont has, you know, has seen in, in agriculture has seen co-ops work um, not only in the big agriculture like dairy, but also um, the things like the uh, cooperative gardening uh, that that's been set up in, in farming at different parts of the state. So I think it's a, I think it's a very promising idea. I'm mute. Nader, your thoughts uh, around this program? Uh, yeah, so similar to Julio, I have a positive feeling about developing um, co-op license. You know, I, I do still have 
lingering thoughts about the logistics of how of uh, how this license would work and you know where land would be purchased where equipment would be purchased and you know whether whether this is a network that would be established in multiple locations in the state or in one central location um, so yeah those, those are my initial thoughts one of um the things that we would like to do for this is to give this as an option for the cannabis control board and then for them to really look into um, establishing how that would look, um, where that location would look, et cetera. Um, and we may be able to get um, someone who's doing some co-ops that are similar in the state of Vermont as well on a, as an expert. Um, but I'm not sure if we have that opportunity. Um, so when we're voting on this, it's the opportunity for the Vermont Cannabis Control Board to, to explore doing this. Um, Ashley? Um, I agree. I think this is really positive. I think about, you know, from a logistics standpoint, I mean, maybe you're already thinking, um, but like, I know of so many uh, processing facilities that are no longer operating because of the boom and bust. So I know there are, I mean, there's auctions all the time for this type of equipment. Uh, I'm wondering for those who are in the processing, there be, you know, like a percentage of their license that is written off because they're going to agree to do a certain percentage of their output with SE applicants. Like, there's a lot of equipment that's already out there. I just wonder how we could utilize it in a way that's not exhausting the, um, the development fund. Um, but I'm definitely in support of, of co-ops, for sure. Great. Right. And I will let you know that, you know, we are hoping to conclude all of these meetings by the end of October. But on November is when we come out and say to people, you know, what education courses do you think we can have out there? What mentorship programs do you think we can get involved? Who wants to donate equipment? How can we utilize what Vermont already has and what we have in the industry to really make such an inclusive program? So this is really just our first and sort of recommendations of what we want that, you know, how can we really implement this and work with social equity, potential social equity candidates out there um, and people who are working in associations or agencies who are already, already dealing with this work and how we can really make this a comprehensive program that really lasts with working with so many different people. Um, so we will be doing that in November. So people out there who are thinking about public comments, please, please come and engage with us. We want to do some town halls. We want to hear your voice. You know, that's really important to us because we will have a program that's bought because of that, um, uh, which we will be doing shortly. So I'm great that everybody is thinking about that already because I certainly am. So I would like to take a vote on just saying that there is a possibility to have a co-op license and then we can uh, further really look into what does that should look like um, for the Vermont Cannabis Control Board. And so Julio, um, yes or no? Yes. Nada? Yes. And Ashley? Yes. Great, that is um, three yeses um, for the record. I, I think it is going to be very fantastic and you know, very Vermont focused and um, to see how this co-op works for, for social equity licensees. Um, next week we'll be starting out with this slide that we're talking about here about cannabis development funds. I sort of just spoke about this a little bit. You know, there is limited funding um, sort of presentation of making 5% of cannabis tax revenue go to this fund to support it, um, creating a social equity cannabis trust um, so we can get public donations. You know, how can you help us? Um, 
also in consideration of time. Um, if you're out there, you want to be a mentor, you want to help this program, you have equipment. If equipment is allowed, we'll find out what the guidelines are from Julie um, before we start to, you know, before people come in. Um, and sort of, you know, what are some of the expenditures that the fund will have, you know, educational courses, operational expenses, workshops. Um, how is it going to be funded? And how can we get low interest loans to social equity licensees? Um, you know, can, can we get some banks um, out there who may be interested in it? Or do are there some investment companies out there who are interested in investing as well? So that we can really make this where this is much larger than just one fund. And so how we can really start to help Continuous, um, continuously fun. And so I leave you with this slide because I know you all like to be prepared and start having your mind start thinking about all of this. Um, I'm always thinking about it, so you can always send me an email if you have some great ideas um, until we speak next time. Um, for the record, we are not going to have a call on Monday that is canceled due to a holiday but we will be having this call on Tuesday at 3 p.m. Um, in lieu of Monday's call. So um, does anyone have any final comments or questions? No? Great. Um, can I have a motion to adjourn? Motion. 